This program contains copyrighted material that may be used for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research under the provisions of Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976. All rights to the copyrighted material used in this program are reserved to their respective owners. who was drawn into Hermetica and Gnosticism through heavy metal music. Despite having been enchanted and seduced by the realm of black and white magic, he overcame, finding Christ and dedicating his life to serving him. We welcome Davy John Garcia as he continues to share his experience with the religion of heavy metal music. Welcome back. No, thank you for having me. So let's start uh, by exploring what happened in the last episode. Catch our audience up. Sure, we, we went through the, the story of my upbringing and how the, there was a lot of occult influence in my, in my family life and my early life and there was a lot of dark supernatural events in my household that fostered this fascination with the occult and paranormal and which later led into dark heavy music which amplified all these things and how I got very heavily involved in dark heavy music and the occult until finally I was freed from that and I found Christ. Amen. Well, let's go into what you mean by a dark spiritual environment in the home. Okay, okay, so back when I was very young, I, w me and my parents would experience a lot of strange apparitions in the home. Um, we thought maybe that they were ghosts, that we lived in a haunted house. We weren't really sure what they were, but we would see strange things that weren't there and we would hear bumps in the night and hear uh, or feel something touch us, pull our hair, push us down the stairs um, and just the feeling of always being watched, especially at night. And this was a, this was a constant in, in the home growing up. So you were able to find out that not only was your grandmother and your mother practicing witchcraft, but that your father was, or grandfather, grandfather. was a part of a secret society known as the... The Freemasons, yes. Okay, so there's this backdrop of just heavy, dark spiritual influences. Yes. And then it opens up this curiosity and this kind of a interaction trying to understand that realm more. Yes, yes, okay. very much so. So then you find heavy metal music. Let's go into that. Dive into what happened and what secrets you were able to get from there. Well, I got, I got very involved in, in this type of music because at the time I was becoming more morose, depressive, and I developed a deeper attraction to darkness. And this was perfect for, um, this was perfect because for getting into the dark, heavy music because it, I felt like that music understood who I was. Mm. And it really resonated with what I was feeling and what I was going through. And it helped me to feel less alone and feel connected with a, a greater community of other people who also kind of understood what I was going through. So it gave you identity. Yes, very much so. And at that time, it was kind of like any other vice to where when you start off, it has to increasingly get more and more intense mm -hmm. in, in order to get the same feeling that you got from the beginning. So as I got into the music, it wasn't overtly occult, mm -hmm. but the more I got into it, I, I needed it to be darker and heavier and more intense and more more blasphemous and extreme. So there's a, a kind of a thirst and a lust yes. that it's, it's feeding into. Absolutely, absolutely. And so what messaging did you find? And, and actually what kind of music? I mean, we, we're saying heavy metal, but sure. who are some of the bands that you were listening to? So whenever I got into it the most intensely, the, it's a subgenre of metal called black metal. Mm. And black metal, it's, it's the most blasphemous, mm -hmm. occult music 
maybe that exists. It's, so is that like Marilyn Manson or? Oh, it's. Or is he like baby yeah, steps compared to this stuff? Yeah, honest, honestly, yes. Uh, black metal, it's, um, it's, all the vocals are like shrieking wails. Mm, it's like, that scary. like shrieking wails, very intense drums, like the faster and more intense the drums, like it's almost like a, a, a point of pride with how intense mm -hmm. you like the, the, you're trying to convey the sound of like a storm mm -hmm. or just raw, chaotic violence through the mm -hmm. drums. And the, the guitars are just, you know, layered guitars on top of each other that sound like, you know, like chainsaws, just, it's just this chaotic cacophony of sound that's mm -hmm. meant to overwhelm you and, and evoke, you know, dark, violent, spiritual right, forces right. and the lyrics are outwardly blasphemous it's anti-christian they love they revel in upside down crosses mm -hmm. inverted pentagrams the whole pageantry of satanism it's a full-on embrace as as much as you can imagine so was there a look as well that went along with this the music and the attitude sure sure the the performers they usually wear if because uh if you're in the audience you might be familiar with a band like kiss Mm -hmm. you know, from the 70s. It's, it's similar to that. It's like black and white face paint. Yeah. It's black and white face paint. And usually, you know, everyone has long hair. You know, that's just a part of the aesthetic. The long hair, black and white face paint, a lot of leather, leather jackets, mm -hmm. um, spikes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, chains, right. a lot of, a lot of uh, black leather. And that's kind of the whole aesthetic of it. And so I've also noticed that there's kind of like an effeminate look to everything as well. Mm. What is that um, about? Do you know? You know, in uh, in black metal, it's black metal. It's less. It's less effeminate. It's, okay. It's actually fairly. It's fairly masculine in mm -hmm. the sense of it's very aggressive. It's extremely okay. aggressive and assertive, and it's. Uh, I w I would say it's less effeminate than maybe some of the some of the more mainstream variants, like Marilyn Manson. Like right. Marilyn Manson is like very effeminate Overtly and kind so. of yeah. glories in the gender bending aspect of it. This mm -hmm. one wasn't so much that. Okay. It was more, it was very strongly masculine, but you, you will find the gender bending. Would you say masculine it. or just kind of demonic and oppressive? I, I would, yeah, I would say that the, it would be a, kind of the masculine expression of demonic force. Of anger. Okay. Right, right. So there's this cacophony raining down on you and emotionally, what is this doing to you? Well, when you're listening to it, because for me, I was, I was already becoming possessed by these forces. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was channeling this kind of nihilistic rage mm -hmm. that I had for the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I hated everything. I hated people. I started hating my parents. Incredible. I hated society. Like I hated everything except music. And this was, it felt like it was channeling these forces. And at the time it feels good because it feels like you're getting all this rage out of you, yeah. but you're not really getting it out. It's just, you're churning it. It's you're just, building it. Right, it's kind of cycling through mm -hmm. you. And the more you listen to it really over time in your life, the angrier, the more depressed and morose that, that you become. But while you're listening to it, it's like, it feels like a cathartic, ex experience. like spiritual experience, yeah. yes. So is there a message in these almost chant-like, you know, lyrics? Yes, it's a, uh, the, the message is, it's a full rejection of life itself. Wow. It's a, it's a full rejection of society and religion and God and, um, Really, really, life itself—it's a—it's a worship of death. Okay. It's a worship of of death and everything that's destructive and violent and ugly and distorted and chaotic and it's it's a it's a worship and a, a love of those things and a full rejection of anything that's that um, speaks of religion or beauty mm -hmm. or order or anything associated with mainstream society. So it sounds like a religion of hate. Would you say that's? Sure, sure. And so did it actually lead you into the, in the direction of a particular spiritual you know, denomination? Well, I think that's how it, uh, that's how, that's how it pulled me in because I, I had those feelings inside of me. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that this really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. But as I, as I got deeper into it, I, I started to develop an attraction to other bands that 
it had that same chaotic, angry mm -hmm. veneer, mm -hmm. but it also started hinting at deeper spiritual understandings mm -hmm. and esotericism and, and things of this nature that, you know, there's, that there actually is a truth out there, but religion is lying to you. Religion all, all, is right, lying. Especially okay. Christianity. That Christianity is the main tool of oppression that's used to trick people mm. into believing mm -hmm. in into a false god mm -hmm. but there is a real god out there there is a real something that we come from a real truth according but to heavy metal right but this isn't it this is this is lying to you interesting well we know that studies show scientifically speaking that music has the ability to bypass the frontal lobe so yes, it yes. skips all reasoning and it goes into a yes. deeper level um, so how did you find yourself seeking that secret knowledge Mm, well, at the time, because it's, it's hand in glove, where I got involved in the occult around the same time I got into the music. And so the, the practices that I developed in the occult, I, would, I was into divination, like spirit boards and tarot cards mm -hmm. and things like this. And as I got into that, I started reading a lot of the literature that was associated with it. Mm -hmm. And me and my friend, we were in, a, we were in a, a black metal band at the time, his name's Paul. We were in a black metal band at the time. And we, were, we would always engage in these occult practices together. We were both into this, the same music, mm -hmm. the same occult practices. We, we grew up in a very similar way. And whenever we would be interacting with these spirit boards and these divination tools, that's actually when we got the idea to start a band to begin with. And the, we were using... A, a Ouija board, and when we're communicating with, with, the, with this being, this entity, it actually gave us the idea to start a band. And that's, that's the whole way we, we got into it. And it would even recommend things to do to, to, really? str to strengthen this connection that we had. And that's when I started looking into Hermetica mm -hmm. and Gnosticism, and it, it kind of gave me like glimpses of what to do, but whenever I would do these practices, it was never super overt. Because mm -hmm. as I got into these practices, it's not like a, it's not a full intellectual knowledge that you're trying to gain, it's more revelatory. Okay. It's like a revelatory experience. Mm -hmm. Because as you get deeper into this, your, the idea of, of hermeticism and Gnostic, these two practices, your, you're ultimately trying to, you're trying to become like a god, mm -hmm. really. There's, mm -hmm. there's this idea that there's this secret knowledge right. that's been withheld from you, right. but was given to these great, maybe you could call them prophets, great teachers, a long time ago. People, even like people like Moses or like Jesus or mm -hmm. like Buddha, mm -hmm. some of these great teachers in the past, these things were revealed to them by the true God, but mm -hmm. over time had become obscured and that religion was, was created by these people, mm -hmm. but really these are just superficial understandings of the truth. Of a and larger... Right, and really there's a true theology mm -hmm. that's hidden underneath. And all of these different religions are pointing to the same true mm -hmm. theology. And I started reading books like the, uh, the Corpus Hermeticum, mm -hmm. um, the, the Emerald Tablets, uh, the Did you get into Aleister Crowley at all? Yes, yes. He's, he's very much a part of the, the hermetic aspect of it. He was involved with, with cults like the Golden Dawn, and that's actually where the popularity of tarot cards come from, is from mm -hmm. Aleister Crowley and the Golden Dawn. But yes, he has his own practice called the Lema, which is just another faction of the, the hermetic movement, which ul the ultimate goal is to become like a god. So you're really deep now in Hermetica, Gnosticism, you know, the, the teachings of Aleister Crowley. You're depressed, you're, you're hating the world. Why did you continue if, if this was the sentiment that you had? Well, thing in, in one sense, things were actually starting to actually go quite well for me for the first time since I can imagine, I can remember rather, I started to gain success in my band. We started to make money mm -hmm. and gain, you know, popularity. I wouldn't call it fame. We weren't famous, but where we were, we were we were pretty well known. And you know, being on stage and having you know so many people screaming and 
giving you so much energy and attention. It's very, it's very seductive and intoxicating. And I felt that my career was starting to take off. And I thought, well, maybe music is something I can actually pursue full time. Mm -hmm. And the more that I got into these occult practices, it's, it's, it's like it wanted me to continue making that music. And mm -hmm. that it seemed like there was something there was something great meant for my life, and the music was wasn't even the whole thing. That was just the beginning, mm -hmm. because really the the whole the end goal of of these practices is to is really to become like a god and to escape from this evil false creation, mm -hmm. which is the way they view the world. Because I I did have this hatred and this anger, but these practices kind of justify that and say, well, the reason why you hate these things is because God, the, there's, an, a, there's a true God, like a, but not like a, not like a person. Mm -hmm. The true God isn't like a person. It's mm -hmm. more like a, a force, like a, mm. it's like an emanation of life, really. So in yoga and, and Hinduism, they call it, you know, the universal God, the, the life force energy. Right, it, it's, some, it's something like that. But the creator of this world is not that God. It's mm -hmm. actually a, a being that they refer to as the Demiurge. Mm. And uh, he's, he has a name, his name's Yaltabaoth. And they, mm. they talk about this in some of the apocryphal, apocryphal uh, texts, mm -hmm. like in the Gospel of Thomas and things like this. Mm -hmm. but Which the, is not part of the canon of the Bible. Right, okay. right, right. This, these are considered Gnostic or apocryphal mm -hmm. texts. Mm -hmm. And they, they talk about the, this being, but this being is a, is a flawed creation himself. It's a godlike, transcendent being, but it's mm -hmm. not a perfect being. Okay. And that being is what created this world. Mm, and this world is something like a, a prison. So why would you submit to a God who is okay with your suffering, who created, you know, flaw, defected people and wants them to ultimately become a god and then kill themselves. I, I don't, mm. what, well, what, what's the, the payoff there for you? Right, well the, the creator of this world is, is likened more to a demon. Mm. And you're, you're, what you're trying to do in these, these, these ancient mystery religions like Gnosticism, Hermeticism, you're trying to gain what they would call a true soul. So you're not born with a soul. A soul is something you have to obtain. And the way you obtain a soul is by becoming fully self-actualized, what Nietzsche would call the ubermensch, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're becoming the fullest expression of yourself. Mm -hmm. And because it's kind of the idea that you have this, this divine destiny, there's, you're, you're born with glimpses of you, but it's broken. And as you move on through life, you're trying to gain the fullest expression of yourself. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung used, has a quote that I'd rather be whole than good, which mm -hmm. I think is actually a pretty good way of explaining the Gnostic view of things. Viewpoint, right? right. So they would say that someone like an evil person, right? Mm -hmm. like someone like Ted Bundy mm -hmm. is, has much more closer to developing a soul than a random person because it's all about be the fullest expression of whatever it is you're given. If right. you're a ser serial killer, be the best serial killer you can be. If you're yeah. a politician, be the best politician, whatever it is, it's the fullest expression of right. that. That's a common phrase that I, as a yoga instructor, would have to you know, coax people and, and motivate them in class was when they were hitting a pose, whether it was a warrior pose or bird of paradise, we would say, you know, breathe it in, breathe it out, hold this position, uh -huh. you know, become the fullest expression of that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's yeah. just interesting to me that there's so many parallels between these divisive mm -hmm. forms of religion and belief um, that just really exalt self Yes. Did you feel actually exalted, though? Yes, I, f I felt that by having access to these beings that would talk to me. Okay, so not in and of yourself, though. Did you feel freedom or did you feel chained to these beings and having to almost uh, live through them? You know, in, in hindsight, yes. At the time, I wouldn't have looked at it that way. Okay. At the time, I would have looked at it that I had the privilege of divining wisdom from these ascended beings mm -hmm. that are trying to guide me to the end goal of escaping from this false world mm -hmm. of, uh, of a false creation. Because mm -hmm. you know, this world, is, it's like a prison. It's like a, 
and Hermetica, like the world is almost like a hallucination. Right. None of this is real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you're not real. Right. None of this is real. This is all just a vibration. Of your, it's, yeah. it's, it's all frequency mm -hmm. and vibration and tricks of light mm -hmm. that make things feel like they're physical, make things feel like they're real. Mm -hmm. But really, that's, it's not. It's none of this is real. And the ultimate goal is to escape from that and to find the ultimate gnosis, mm -hmm. which is the ultimate secret knowledge that's revealed to you Mm -hmm. from on high that allows you to gain a true soul and escape from this and reunite with God mm -hmm. and become God. Really, that's, the old, that's really the secret. That's the ultimate yeah. secret is that actually you are God. Right. That's right, really right, the right. ultimate secret. And Which the is the biggest lie. I mean, it, it reminds me of like a dog chasing its own tail. Mm -hmm. um, you just keep kind of running in this circular pattern trying new things, trying new ways of supposed enlightenment, new methods, and you end up getting darker and darker, you know, getting mm -hmm. into this abysmal um, sequence of things. Mm -hmm. How did you find your way into Christianity? Mm, well, after... Like in the last episode, we talked about the Bible. Yeah. We talked about how you discovered, you know, the, the prose and the poetry and everything within the Bible, and that started to open you up. Yes. But was it automatic or did you find yourself in service in a Christian way? Mm, well, it was a couple of things that all kind that kind of came together at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, now I'd look at it as providence. But as I was developing a secular fascination with the Bible, mm -hmm. and this is after I had started to move away from these more occult practices, and I was just kind of insert just neutrally in search. Mm -hmm. of what truth actually was and after I had moved away from these dark practices. And I developed this secular interest in the Bible. And at the time when I was very fascinated with the Bible and I started reading it out of a secular pers intellectual pursuit, really, mm -hmm. I started to get really sick. Mm. And during that time, I got really sick. And I, it, was, it was so bad to where I was starting to question whether I was gonna make it or not. I would, I would get these horrible, you know, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with this crushing chest pressure and pain. Mm -hmm. I couldn't breathe. And I had no idea what was happening to me. Doctors didn't know what was happening to me. They thought maybe it was lupus or an autoimmune disease, but no one was sure it was happening to me. Wow. And just at that time, I happened to run into some Seventh-day Adventists who just so happened to own a lifestyle center mm -hmm. and just so happened to specialize in treating autoimmune disease. Okay. And so at the same time I'm learning about the Bible, I meet these people and they, they barely knew anything about me, mm -hmm. but they were just needlessly loving and kind to me. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminded me of that last line from that poem from the book of John where the, the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not because mm -hmm. it I couldn't even understand why they were being nice to me. Like why they're almost thinking, what do you really want? What are you after? Right, right. Because I had always viewed Christians as, you know, charlatans and mm -hmm. uh, uh, hypocrites. Hypocrites, yeah, right? Yeah. Hypocrites. And so when I saw these people who are really trying to embody the character of Christ, it was very surprising to me. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't even understand why they would why they would care about me. They barely knew who I was. Mm -hmm but they gave me a whole, they showed me the health message, right? The Adventist health message. Mm -hmm. And through that, when I, cause I rejected it for a while, I was stubborn, but once I submitted to it, mm -hmm. in about three weeks, I got better. Amen. And about three weeks I got better. And at that time, I remember thinking about this, like, you know, the Bible and these people that had come into my life. And I just felt really grateful. Right. I felt really grateful. Right. And for the first time since I was a kid, I just prayed. I just prayed Beautiful. and I, I thanked God, whoever you are, you mm -hmm. know, whoever you are, you know, if, if you're there, if you're real, you know, thank you for, for helping me. And that's, that's really what planted the first seeds in me that developed into the Christian walk that I'm on now. So you recently graduated from AFCO. Tell us a little bit, bit about that. Yes, it was, a. Uh, that was a huge blessing. And AFCO, I wasn't, I never imagined that I would have even gotten into AFCO. I, I barely even knew what AFCO was, honestly, because I've, I've been- Tell in, our audience what that is. So AFCO, it's the Amazing Facts uh, Center for Evangelism. Mm -hmm. And so 
um, a lot of Christians who usually they want to become theologians or mm -hmm. pastors or mm -hmm. they just want to deepen their own understanding of scripture and be able to better share that with people that are in their vicinity. Mm -hmm. You go there and they, they teach you how to do that. They teach you more about the Bible. They teach you how to share your faith, how to defend your faith. They go deeper into the doctrinal aspect of it. And it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. It's right. very rewarding and it's all day it's just spiritual. You know. So you get into this mm -hmm. and how long have you been a Christian at this point? About three months. That's incredible, just three months. Yes, and you have to actually be a baptized Christian for about a year to even get into AFCO at all. It's incredible. God just keeps leading you in the right direction. We're, we actually want to have that same experience with some of our members in the audience. Would you be so kind to give them a word of encouragement in case they have a child who's going through this or if someone in the audience themselves is going through this? Yes. Music, music is very powerful. It's a lot more powerful than we give it credit for. And when if you go into any high school today, you'll see that children will segregate themselves into cliques based on the type of music that they listen to. You know, you'll have the goth kids and the jocks and different, different types of kids will gravitate because they form their whole identities around the music they listen to, the language they use, the, the way they speak, the way they think, it's all informed by the music. And they get so much, they get so much purpose and meaning from that. And so as a parent, don't discount that. You should be, be involved in your kids' lives and don't take lightly of what they listen to because it could have profound spiritual ramifications that could last throughout the entirety of their life even. And so I would encourage you to be very careful about the music that you're listening to, the music that you allow your kids to listen to because it, it's, it matters. It matters a lot. And if you're someone who's currently involved in something like that, don't forget how, how powerful of an effect it can be having on your psyche, on your relationship with God, because even music that can seem trivial, that's, that's not overtly blasphemous or satanic or anything like that, can still be having a very strong effect on your mind and the way, the way you view the world. Thank you so much for those words of encouragement. You know, when we were actually developing this program, this series, I was researching, you know, who and, and what to cover because it's really a broad, you know, scope. And I saw your AFCO testimony and I really believe even this moment is providential in your life. I can't wait to see where God takes you next. Modern music history seems to support the idea that Satan has profound musical ability. Testimonies of mega music stars report of a supernatural being helping them create irresistible rhythms, melodies, and lyrics in exchange for promoting things contrary to the Bible. These events are truly prophetic and a sign of the times that we are currently in. We urge you at home, please take time to read your scripture. Take time to heed the warnings therein. Your salvation depends on it. Until next time, this has been a Wolfs in Sheep's Clothing.